forgot. Greenland, the moment I decided I wanted to become a scientist. By show of hands, how many people have ever been insecure about their future or not sure if they made the right decision, yes or no? Yeah. Well, I was no different. As a high school student, I absolutely did not know what I wanted to do with my life. And I was thinking about going to college, but everyone told me, no, you can't do it. Don't even bother. I wouldn't try. But I tried it anyway, and I succeeded. And then I went on this internship to Greenland, and that's when it all changed for me. That's when I had my eureka moments. Greenland was absolutely amazing. The animals there are not used to humans, so they're not afraid of us. So I literally felt like Snow White because the birds would just fly up, the caribous would walk up to us and mind their own business, and that was such an amazing feeling. And it is so quiet there. You might be able to hear a bird or two, but that's it. And the closer you go towards the ice caps, you can start uh, to hear the cracking of the ice, and trust me when I tell you, that's a sound you'll never want to forget. And to think that I almost couldn't go on this trip because I had injured my knee a couple of weeks beforehand. Greenland is located on the northeast of Canada and it has about 56,000 inhabitants spread over an area of 840,000 square miles. So if you do the math, then that's less than half a person per square mile. And it's um, it's easy to think that with such a low population density, there's not going to be a lot of industry. The biggest industry they have is fishing, and this doesn't account for a lot of pollution. But if you look at the literature, there's actually quite a bit of pollution in Greenland. So where does this come from? When pollution is created, some of it will go up into the atmosphere. And then with wind, it will actually be spread over the entire world. And the closer you go towards the poles, the colder the air will get. And cold air won't be able to hold as much uh, moisture, so it will start to rain or snow. And we all know when there's snow and there's pressure, it will turn into ice. But then when these clouds of pollution come in, the pollution will actually be dragged down and be stored in the ice. So after a while, we will have layers and layers and layers of pollution in the ice. And we can actually backtrack in time. So global warming is happening. Uh, even Leonardo DiCaprio was talking about it in his Oscar speech. And we've all seen the video of polar bears drowning because of the lack of ice. And OK, the ice melts every, uh, every summer and it comes back every winter. But the amount of ice that is melting every single summer is increasing and increasing. And that's worrisome. To give you an idea how fast the ice is actually melting in Greenland, take a look at this video I took. This is purely from ice melting, nothing else. So can you imagine how fast, well, how much ice has to melt in order to have such a strong current? That's kind of frightening to me. So where does this water go? It creates lakes. So when glaciers melt, they will retreat. And the lakes that are closer, well, closer, they uh, will be younger than the lakes that are further away from the glacier. So we thought, well, the lakes that are older, they will be exposed to the atmosphere for longer, so they'll likely have more pollution. Also, the lakes that uh, are glacier-fed, they will have pollution in the ice, will be transported through the water into the lakes. So they're also more likely to have pollution. So we hypothesize that old lakes that are glacier-fed will contain the most amount of pollution compared to the younger lakes that are not glacier-fed. Not only were we interested in water, we also wanted to know what the pollution was in soil and in macroinvertebrates. And in order to do this, we took samples at seven, seven different lakes, each at a different distance towards the glacier, and three of which were glacier-fed. We looked at water characteristics like temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and so on. We took one, it's probably hard to see, one Eppendorf tube of macroinvertebrates. It's pretty tiny. And we took one liter of water that's about 33 ounces, if I'm correct, uh, 50 milliliters of sediment, which is about two ounces. And boy, let me tell you, it was quite a challenge trying to get enough macroinvertebrates to fill this tiny tube. Because if you take a look, see how this works? Yeah, the top left picture, those are mosquito larvae, and they are tiny. So in order to fill this up, it took us forever. And we only had one day to do it. 
Even the bigger ones, like the uh, beetle larvae, by the time we collected a bunch of them, we realized they were eating each other, so we had to start <laughs> all over again. Yeah. So what did we look for? We looked for perfluoroalkylated substances, and this is made when producing Teflon. That's like the anti-stick layer in pots and pans, also used to make clothing uh, water resistant. We were interested in metals like lead, mercury, zinc, and so on. And we were interested in both of them because they're easily transported through the atmosphere, and also because we had, well, everything ready in the lab to do it. Now, I, don't, I only have 10 minutes today, so I can't really go into detail, but we saw that the glacier-fed lakes were significantly colder, which makes sense because, well, yeah, ice is cold. Then for the perfluoroalkylated substances, we saw something weird. The non-glacier-fed lakes actually had a higher percentage than the glacier-fed lakes, and this was the reverse of what we thought was going to happen. Then the older lakes, they contained more cadmium, so the further away we went from the ice caps, the higher the concentration was. And lastly, we saw bioaccumulation of zinc and perfluoroalkylated substances. So this means the micro, macroinvertebrates that were eating other animals, they had a higher concentration inside their body. We did have some problems with our data because we were only there for seven days, and well, most scientists here will know that's not a lot of data. And the lakes were so different in size that if you compare number three to number two, that's very hard to do. Greenland was amazing, but it did have some flaws. We didn't have any transportation, no plumbing, no housing. So basically, we had to walk everywhere. We had to eat the same food every single day, and even five years later, I can't eat these cookies, please don't do it to me. <laughs> we had to wash in the lakes, which was about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, so it was kind of painful. We had to use the same water to cook with, and with that amount of wind, that was frustrating. Then Greenland doesn't get dark in the, uh, in the summer, my apologies. So the picture in the middle, yeah, that was uh, the condition we had to sleep in. So it was that light, that was midnight. And then it got really cold at night. And I didn't bring enough, uh, like a good enough blanket. So I actually had to sleep underneath an emergency blanket. And as you can hear, trying to sleep with this is definitely a challenge. But probably the biggest challenge of all was going to the restroom because we had to use a shovel. And there was one side of the hill that was called our restroom. So if the shovel was gone, we knew someone was going to the toilet. And we had to dig our own hole. But as soon as we took off our pants, the mosquitoes would attack. <laughs> so basically, you had to go to the bathroom and rub your legs the entire time, hoping that they wouldn't be able to bite. But if you were unlucky, that was the result. I do apologize for the picture. Um, so remember that I told you I almost couldn't go on this trip? Turns out my knee was fractured in half and the cartilage inside was loose. And I've been walking like 10 miles a day with that knee, so whoops. <laughs> the good, the bad, but boy, what a trip. I hope to become a professor and take students with me on trips like these in, over, in order to inspire them and hopefully they will have their own eureka moment. And it's funny because in the beginning I was so afraid of not knowing what comes next, but as a, a scientist now that's part of my everyday life. I have to figure out what comes next and I'm not afraid anymore. I love it. Thank you.